excited to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. Um, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. And um, we're actually, we're going to jump to the very, very, very beginning um, of the scriptures. Genesis chapter 1. We're going to read verses 1 and 2 um, as we start this morning. And uh, I just want to tell you from the outset what my purpose and my goal is. Um, and being here and sharing the word with you is today, um, simply put, it is to provoke faith within you. It's to inspire faith in you concerning who your God is and what your God is able to do. Um, in 2019, the Lord gave me personally a couple of scriptures, and, um, and he told me that these scriptures would characterize or that he desired that these scriptures would characterize my ministry from that point forward. One of those scriptures was Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 25. And it says, anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. And an in-season word right. makes him glad. Another verse that he gave me was Isaiah 50 and verse 4, where the prophet Isaiah says that the Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned, that I would know how to speak a word in season to those who are weary. The idea being that we would be anointed by the Spirit of God to inspire and to provoke faith in the hearts of people, especially when they find themselves in dark, desperate seasons and situations. And so just from the outset, um, I'm just going to tell you that, that my purpose and my goal today is to provoke faith to inspire faith in your heart and who your God is and what he's able to do. Genesis chapter 1, um, like I said, we're just going to read verses 1 and 2, and then we'll get into our discussion for today. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of of the waters. I want to speak to you this morning from a thought that I've entitled the blessing of nothingness and darkness. The blessing of nothingness and darkness. Now that might sound somewhat oxymoronic because normally we don't equate nothingness and darkness with anything good, especially not with that of divine blessing. But I believe Sometimes God sees things differently than we do. Amen. And I believe that if we'll see it in the scriptures and believe it with our hearts, that there, has, there is actually something good and even divine about God allowing you and I to encounter nothingness and darkness. Because they do something to put the glory of God on display in us and around us that nothing else has the ability to do. And so I want to talk to you about the blessing of nothingness and darkness. Let's pray. Father, I thank you with all of my heart, God, for the opportunity to be in this house today. Father, I thank you for how our hearts have already been stirred as we've come into this place, assembling together, God, to worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, I just pray today that you would be present, God, throughout the remainder of this service to stir and to provoke our hearts to faith in who you are and in what you're able to do in the time and hour in which we live. Father, I pray that we would be able to end this year and enter the new year, God, with a renewed measure of faith in our hearts, God, believing that just as you have, you are still presently able to do the impossible, that you are able to do the miraculous and the supernatural in our day and in our hour. And so, Father, help us today by your Holy Spirit. God, would you give every one of us in this house the ability to see, to hear, and to receive everything that is in your heart for us to receive. And God, when it's all said and done as we do now, we'll be sure to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 As Christians, we believe that the Bible is an inspired text. It's more than just the thoughts and the opinions of man passed down through generations. It is, in fact, 
inspired. Yes. Inspired means that it is God conceived and it's God breathed. Inspiration points to God as the ultimate author of Scripture. It says that although he used different men in different generations to pin down different thoughts and truths, ultimately all of those thoughts and truths were superintended by God yes. himself. And so when we read the Bible, what we need to know is that the Bible is more than just what men wanted other men to know about God. The Bible is what God wanted men to know about God. It's his self-revelation. It's what he has to say to humankind about himself. Paul says it like this in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Or all Scripture is God-authored or God-breathed. And the Scriptures, that which is God-authored and God-breathed, is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God, that's you and I, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Or so that what is necessary for our effectiveness in kingdom service may be continually added to us as we mix our faith with the truth that we are learning and hearing about what God has to say about himself. And so in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, Paul says two radical things about the Bible. Number one, it's inspired. It's God-breathed and it's God-authored. But secondly, he says that it's efficacious. That just simply means that the Bible has the ability to alter and empower our lives. It's more than just truth that we retain for truth's sake. That this truth, because it is inspired, it is alive, it is authored by God, it has the ability to alter, to transform and to empower our lives. Yes. Now, when we're reading Genesis specifically, what we're reading is God's initial self-revelation. Mm -hmm. In other words, these are the first things that he has to say about himself to humankind. The term Genesis speaks of beginnings or origins. That's what the word Genesis means. It speaks of beginnings or origins. But not only is Genesis a book of beginnings in that it describes the beginnings of the world, humankind, or civilization, but Genesis is also a book of beginning in that it is the beginning of God beginning to speak to humankind about himself. In other words, these are the very first things that I want you to know about me. This is the way that I want to introduce myself to you. Hallelujah. There, you know, in, in the MLB, when you're watching people walk up to bat, and you may not know who that particular player is, a lot of times there is a what they call a walk-up song that the batter walks to the plate um, with. And that walk-up song is really to give those in the crowd and those in, in the audience just a little glimpse into who that person is, what his character is like, what his style is, the things that he holds dear to his heart. That walk-up song is meant to just give the audience a little bit of an idea as to who this guy is if they don't know who he is. Well, that's what Genesis is. Genesis is God's walk-up song, if you will. It's God stepping up to the plate and him beginning to tell us about who he is and what he's like. And so Genesis is how God wants to set the stage for our understanding of who he is and what he's able to do in the world. And so this is how God begins to speak to us about himself. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning, yes. God created the heavens and the earth. And so the first thing that God wants us to know about himself is that he is a creator. Now the term create simply means to bring into existence. If you've ever read a dictionary, often following the definition of a particular word, it'll give you examples as to how that word is best used in a sentence or in a real life scenario. 
What I love about Webster's Dictionary is Webster's Dictionary actually lists Genesis 1 and verse 1 as the reference or as the best example for the definition of create. It's like the writer of Webster's Dictionary said, I don't know how to better explain what it means to create than to refer you to God creating everything from nothing in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. God bringing something into existence. Now the verb create, or the action of creating, um, it occurs 10 times in Genesis 1 through 6 alone. So just in the first six chapters of the Bible, we read this verb create. The, we see the action of creating. Now, there's two interesting things to note about how the verb create is used in Genesis chapter 1 through 6. Number one, God is always the subject of the verb. In other words, God is always the one creating. But secondly, and perhaps more uh, importantly, is that there is never any reference in all six chapters, in all ten examples of the word create being used, there is never any reference to any pre-existent matter or material that God uses in the creating. So number one, God is always the subject of the verb. He's always the one creating. But secondly, and you've got to hear this, there is never any reference to any pre-existent matter or material that God uses in creating what He creates. The idea is this, that God's creative power, His ability to create, is not dependent upon the pre-existence of the proper matter or material. That God can actually create something from nothing. Yes. His creative power is not dependent upon something already being in place that he can draw from or use in order to create the thing that he's wanting to create, in order to achieve the goal that he's trying to achieve. Often, when we are given a task to do, whether it's in uh, our job or in ministry or at school, um, we're given the tools and the resources necessary to complete the task that we've been asked to complete. Uh, you're going to write this paper on the material that I present in class today. Uh, you're going to be on the worship team with the instruments that the church provides you uh, so that you can be an effective worship team person or a worship leader. Um, you're going to build this house with the lumber and the material that we get from Home Depot. You're given a task, you're given a job to do, but you're always given provisions and resources prior to being asked to complete ta that task in order to be able to bring it about. We're usually not asked to come up with something out of thin air. We're given tools right. and we're given resources right. and we're asked to successfully utilize them and create what we've been asked to create, but not God. God creates from nothing. Yes. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 3 says it this way, by faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. I want to say that one more time. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. Listen, so that what is seen was not made out of that which was visible. And so not only is God a creator, but his creative power is not limited by the lack of useful material, resources, or tools. Actually, the expression of his creative power is greatest seen in taking nothing and doing something significant with it. Yes. Think of it. Genesis 1 and 1 begins with nothing, only God, and ends with everything that we know and see today. Praise God. Hallelujah. Genesis 1 in the beginning, what was God? There was nothing else beside him. In the beginning, God 
created the heavens and the earth. The only thing in the beginning, at least what God wanted us to know, was himself. But that was enough to create the life-giving, life-sustaining world that you and I see today. Yahweh creates everything from nothing. And so the thought that we have to begin to ask ourselves today is, can nothing, or can nothingness, nothingness simply meaning the utter lack of something, can nothing or nothingness, Stand in the way of the display of God's omnipotence. No, because if it could, it would mean that he wasn't omnipotent. He is omnipotent. He's all powerful, which means that no one or no thing can stand in the way of him being who he wants to be and doing what he wants to do in the world. Nothing can stand in his way. He creates everything from nothing. I don't need anything. Just give me nothing and I'll do with nothing what only I am able to do. Nothing plus God equals something divine and something significant. God steps into nothingness, the utter lack of anything. And creates for us the life-giving and life-sustaining world that we see today. It's not only astounding, though, to witness the creative power of God. This idea of nothing plus God equaling, equaling something. But it's also astounding to see the environments in which His creative power is greatest expressed. Look with me to verse 2 of Genesis chapter 1. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the face of the deep. Such terms in Genesis 1 and 2, without form, void, darkness over the face of the deep. Such terms suggest that the environment that God began to create in, it was dark. It was dysfunctional, it was disorderly, and it was desolate. Mm -hmm. That's the conditions in which God begins to express his creative role and his creative power. However, what I love about Genesis 1 and 2 is that God neither avoids this darkness nor does he become overwhelmed by it. The Bible actually goes on to say at the end of the verse that he steps into it and he begins to disrupt it. Genesis 1 and 2 begins with darkness, but it ends with the Spirit of God moving over this dark, desolate, dysfunctional environment. There's something in Bible study uh, that Pastor Matt can tell you more about later or perhaps He's talked to you about before, but there's something in Bible study called the law of first mention. And the idea of the law of first mention is that anytime something is mentioned, some theological truth or principle is mentioned for the first time in Scripture, it begins to set precedent for how that work is carried out throughout the rest of the Bible and throughout the rest of history. That Law of first mention, a word, a theological truth or principle being mentioned for the first time in Scripture, it establishes a framework for how we can expect that same attribute or work of God to be seen and observed in subsequent times and in subsequent generations. The first mention of God, Genesis 1 and 1, has him associated with nothing. In the beginning, God. The first mention of the Spirit of God, the breath of God, has Him associated with darkness. Genesis 1 and 2, the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the deep. The first mention of God associated with nothing. The first mention of the Spirit of God associated with darkness. And it's not in the sense of either nothingness or darkness 
threatening him or putting his godness in jeopardy. But in the sense of him stepping into them and overcoming them with his power. From the very beginning, God was trying to show humankind that he is not overwhelmed by nothingness and he is not afraid of darkness. The first mention of God and the spirit of God has him creating from nothing and dispelling darkness. God says, this is how I want to introduce myself. By showing you that I can step into nothing and do something with it. And to show you that I'm not afraid or overwhelmed by darkness. When I show up, darkness has to leave and it has to vanish. This is how I want you to know me. From this point forward, everything I do on your behalf is going to consist of me stepping into your nothingness, doing something miraculous with it, and dispelling the darkness that holds you in captivity. Praise God. It has him. Genesis 1, 1 and 2 has God addressing and overcoming the two things that threaten and terrify us. What terrifies us more than emptiness and lack and nothingness? What terrifies us more than darkness and desolation and dysfunction? The two things that threaten and terrify us on a day-to-day basis are the two things from the very beginning that God says to us, I have no problem handling. They're not beyond the reach of my power and they're not outside of the sphere of what I'm able or what I'm willing to do. What I love about God is that He's not only omnipotent, He's not only all-powerful, He's consistent. That just simply means He does not change. Genesis 1, 1 and 2 in my eyes, set precedent for who God is and what God does best. It sets precedent that if God was this to one generation, then He can be this to future generations. That if God was able to do X, Y, and Z at this point in time, then God can still do X, Y, and Z in this moment in time. God is not afraid of nothingness and darkness. Praise God. These conditions actually provide the environments necessary for Him to do what He does best. Not only is He not afraid of them, but they, nothingness and darkness, think of what I'm saying to you. They actually provide the environments necessary for us to see Him in the grandest and most glorious of ways. If there was something prior to God in Genesis 1 and 1, maybe not for you, but for me, it downplays at least a little God's creative role and His creative power. If the earth was beautiful and grand and great in Genesis 1 and 2, rather than dark, desperate, and dysfunctional, I wouldn't have opportunity to know that He's the God who dispels darkness. So while we're afraid of nothingness and darkness, those two things actually set the stage for God to show up and do what He does best. They set the stage for God to show up and show out. They are the platforms upon which God shows us His glory in the greatest and grandest of ways. Somebody talk to me on a Sunday morning right there. Amen. And so my question to you, though simple, is this. What of your nothingness? What of your darkness? Have you been convinced that God is somehow afraid of or overwhelmed by what you are afraid of and overwhelmed by? Have you been led to believe that your nothingness or your darkness, no matter how nothing or how dark it is, 
stands in the way of God wanting to do in and through your life all that He's desired to do? Have you been led to believe that your nothingness and your darkness somehow ties His hands and limits Him from being able to do in your life the great things that Pastor Matt keeps telling you that He wants to do in your life? What voice has convinced you to believe the lie that your lack or the darkness that cap captivates you is too much for God and that God could never step into such nothingness, such lack, that He could never interrupt such darkness and depravity that you are the one person that is beyond hope. That you are the one person that's too nothing or too dark that you're the one person that somehow limits God from being who God says that He is. God, listen to me, is not limited by the things that limit us. God is not terrified by the things that terrify us. What God asks of us simply is that we believe Him that we invite Him by faith into our dark, nothing situations and lives, and that we believe that with that nothing and with that dark, He can do what only He can. Praise God. I know what it feels like to be in nothingness or to feel personally as a person like I am nothing. I know what it is to be bound by darkness and by dysfunction. But can I testify to you today? I know it not just because I've read it in the Bible. I know it because I've experienced in my own life God stepping in to my nothingness and my darkness over and over and over again and proving to me who He is and what He's really able to do. Amen. My nothingness and my darkness has not prevented him thus far. And if I were to be honest with you, I would say to you that many days, I feel like the worst nothing amongst nothings there are. Sometimes I feel trapped by more darkness than other people do. But God has been consistent. He's been faithful over and over again in my life to show me that nothingness and darkness can't stand in the way of Him doing in and through my life what He wants to do. I know it's discouraging, but have you ever dared to ask God, God, what could you do with a situation like this? I know lack Jesus. is overwhelming. I know darkness is terrifying. But have you ever dared to ask God, God, how do you see this? What could you do with the thing that I feel is beyond hope, beyond repair, beyond restoration? What could you do with this nothingness and this darkness? My God. Beloved, I say to you, this is the gospel message. Jesus, Jesus. According to Ephesians chapter 2, before Christ, we were in a dark and desperate place. Mm -hmm. Ephesians chapter 2 details what it's like for those outside of Christ to live and to exist. It says of those outside of Christ, which is you and I before knowing Him, that we were actually ruled by the darkness of this age. Read the beginning of Ephesians 2 and terms that are used in Genesis 1 and 2 are similar to terms that are used in Ephesians 2 concerning our spiritual state before knowing God by faith in Christ. That we were dark, we were desolate, we were dysfunctional. But then, the Spirit of God Hallelujah. began to hover yes, yes, yes. over the face of the deep. Yes. Oh, my God. Over that dark, <coughs> desperate, dysfunctional, <coughs> desolate environment that I call my sinful heart. Mm. That's right. The Spirit of God began to move. Thank you. you see, it doesn't matter what's not present 
so long as the Holy Spirit is present. Oh, yes. It doesn't matter what's lacking, so long as the Holy Spirit is present. As long as the Holy Spirit is present, the impossible yes. becomes possible. Yes. As long as the Holy Spirit is present, there is nothing that can stand in the way of God doing what He wants to do. And I say to you today, beloved, that if it's possible for God in Genesis 1, 1 and 2 to speak into nothing and to give you and I the something that we have today, then it must be possible that He can step into your life today and begin to do something supernatural and something miraculous. Oh, Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. If it's possible for God by the word of His mouth, to create the life-giving, life-sustaining world that we see today. What happens immediately after Genesis 1, 1 and 2? After the Spirit of God is seen hovering over this darkness and nothingness? What begins to happen? Verse 3, and God said, let there be yes. light. Yes. And from that moment forward, for the next six days, God begins to... To create the life-giving, life-sustaining world that we see today. Yes. What started with nothingness and darkness ends with a beautiful testimony of who God is and what He's able to do. Yes. Yes. And if God could step into that nothingness and give us the something that we have in the world today, why do you think <laughs> that it's impossible for God to step into yours? And do something significant and supernatural Amen. today. Yes. And you know what I love? Is that once God begins to step into your life. You're going to begin to step into others lives. Yes. Yes. Touched by the spirit and by the power yes. of God. And you're going to begin to bring life to them. Hallelujah. I want you to notice beginning in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 3. Anything that God created. Had the ability to bring life to something yeah. else. Amen. Everything. Praise God. Everything God created had the ability to bring life yes. to something. It was purposeful. It was not an end in itself. Yes. Its purpose was to give life or to sustain life yes. on the behalf of something or someone yes. else. Amen. That's so good. And that's going to be the story with your life if you'll begin to believe God. Yes. Amen. If you'll begin to believe that God can step into your nothingness and your darkness. That no matter how nothing it is, no matter how dark it is, that God can step into it by faith and He can begin to do the supernatural and the miraculous through your life, you're not just going to be a recipient of God's power. You're going to be a conduit of His power. And His power is going to begin to flow in you and through you to the lives of other people. What He does in you is not going to be an end in itself. It's going to bring life and hope and healing and restoration to someone else. God can not only take nothingness and do something with it, but here's my testimony. He can also take nothings and do something through them yes, right. to change the world. Yeah. I know that to be true. And if I'm here for one or two people this morning, then so be it. Yes. I know that this is a word from the Lord. He put it so strongly on my heart this week. The moment Matt asked me to preach, I knew exactly what I, what I was to preach this morning. That there's someone in this house today who you're battling. You're battling with nothingness. You're battling with darkness. And you're finding it so hard, if not impossible, to believe that God is able to step into your life and to restore you, to heal you, to save you. Maybe you've never known Christ before in your life. And you're finding it hard to believe that God can do in and through your life what He's done through the lives of other people. I'm here to provoke you to faith. I'm not hiding my, my goal here today. Sometimes preachers try to hide what they're trying to do. No manipulation here. I'm open and honest. I'm here to provoke you to faith. To stir you to faith. 
yes. to inspire you prayerfully by the Spirit of God yes. Yes. to believe. Yes, hallelujah. I don't know about you, Naya, you can come up if you want and begin to play. But I I want to go into 2024. Yeah, yes. Believing that no matter how dark and desperate it gets, God is still God. Thank you. Yes. And He's still able to do God things. Thank you, Jesus. If I understand Scripture correctly, if I listen to pastors we're sensitive to the Holy Spirit in this day and hour correctly, then it seems to me that darkness and dysfunction is only going to increase in the next few years. That's right. That, that we are getting closer, regardless of what you believe about eschatology, end time events, we are getting closer to the coming of the Lord. Yes. And the scriptures are abundantly clear that the closer we get, the more the earth is going to groan and travail. The more things are going to transpire in the world that cause concern, trepidation, fear in our hearts. The love of many are going to wax cold. Sons and daughters are going to turn against mothers and fathers. Those who once walked closely with God will walk with Him no more. Those who try to be a true light and testimony for Christ are going to be opposed and persecuted on every hand. Those who are truly committed to advancing the kingdom of God in their generation are going to be opposed, contested on every hand. And so it is true, if we're honest with ourselves and we're honest about how we understand the scriptures, that in the coming days, things are not going to get easier. They are going to become more difficult. But what I know in reading scripture is that God doesn't need good situations, good environments, good places in order to do good God kind of work. You want New Testament? I'll give it to you. From the time the Spirit of God was poured out on the early church in Acts chapter 2, that church was viciously opposed. Every step of the way they were threatened. People attempted to silence them. They beat them physically. They imprisoned them. Eventually, most of them from that early group became martyrs for the cause of Jesus Christ. You want to talk about difficult? We don't know difficult yet. Come on. You want to talk about dark? You want to talk about a dysfunctional world? That was it. But you know what I read through the book of Acts? Is that despite darkness, despite dysfunction, despite depravity, the Spirit of God raised up men and women of God to do the miraculous in the face of it all? Yeah. That demons and devils and desolation could not stop the church from being the church that God had called in her When I read amidst the world that tried to overthrow them, is that the church was known as a people who turned the world upside down for the glory of God. This is how their enemies recognize them. Not brothers and sisters in the church. Those who oppose them said, Hey, aren't these the people who have changed the world for the glory of God? It wasn't the church saying that about the church. It was the enemies of God saying that about the church. Because God said, I don't need perfect environments to do my greatest works. You give me darkness, you give me opposition, you give me demons and devils, give me hell itself, and I'll show up and show you that I'm God. I don't need good to be God. I'm God all by myself. And you put me anywhere, and you watch what I'll do. Father, I thank you with all of my heart 
for the opportunity to share your word today. Father, I pray in the next few moments as we respond to you, in whatever way we feel the need to respond to you today, I pray that our hearts would be filled with faith today. God, that we would be filled with a renewed measure of faith in who you are and in what you're able to do. God, I pray for the person today who has of late been led to believe that their nothingness and their darkness stands in the way of who you are and what you're able to do in and through their lives. I pray today, God, that every lie of the enemy would be vanquished in their heart and in their mind. I pray that the truths of your word by the power of your Holy Spirit would silence every voice of doubt, every voice of intimidation, every voice of insecurity in the name of Jesus, that you would silence it, my God, by your spirit, by your word, God, and that your truth concerning who you are and what you're able to do, God, that it would ring louder than every other voice, God, that is speaking to them in this moment of time. God Almighty, would you captivate hearts today? Would you arrest hearts with your truth by your Holy Spirit right now? Would you begin to minister to people, God, as only you can? God, would you be, a, be God to us in this moment and that you would bring us from darkness into light. You would bring us from nothingness, God, into the something that you have for us and into the something that you alone are able to create us to be God. By your power, would you meet with us today? God Almighty, do what only you can. Minister to hearts today. In Jesus' name.